Hey there, uh, my name is Desiree Elliott and I'm here from uh, InQB. Uh, I'm going to be presenting to you today uh, regarding how to do business in Hong Kong considering uh, COVID at the moment. So um, maybe let me explain a little bit more about InQB, the company that I work for, so you understand why I'm able to talk to you about this. Uh, so we're an online corporate services provider. And we connect entrepreneurs, uh, startups, SMEs uh, with solutions for company setup, maintenance, so accounting, audit, tax filing, etc. in Hong Kong. We do help with other jurisdictions as well, but Hong Kong is like our specialty. Um, so yeah, so that's why I'm able to talk to you about this here today and be sharing with you a little bit about how to go about setting up in Hong Kong. But, you know, maybe before I go into that, I will just go into maybe why you might even consider Hong Kong in the first place in case you're considering it or or not for that matter. Um, so uh, yeah, by the end of this, hopefully uh, your entrepreneurial life coming into Hong Kong will be less like this or from this rather uh, to this, okay? So uh, first and foremost, why in Hong Kong? Um, well, it's located in the heart of Asia. Um, Hong Kong is uh, well located, has a lot of access to China. It's actually a stepping stone. A lot of people use it as a stepping stone into China. Uh, so that's one reason, aside from other countries around the region, it's, it's just a general central area to be in, right? Um, and setting up a business in Hong Kong also is very quick. Okay, I'll talk more about incorporation matters in a bit, um, but it can be completed within a week, um, even actually within the day, if you have access to a uh, Hong Kong CPA or, um, or lawyer who can certify your documents, some providers can also help with that. Um, also in Hong Kong, there's uh, you can't have a company that is 100% foreign owned. Um, so if you want to be the sole director shareholder or you want your company, your overseas company in the Philippines, if you want that to be um, the owner of the company in Hong Kong, your entity here, that is 100% no problem. You don't even need to have a director, actually a local director. I mean, you need to have a director, but not a local director. Uh, but I'll go into more details about that later. Um, scope of business also in Hong Kong is not limited to the nature that you're reporting uh, officially on your business registration. Uh, so you could, example, um, I'll talk about more of that again also a bit further. Um, but yeah, you could have, for example, your, you, you put trading as your official business nature, and then uh, you might be doing consulting on the side as well. That's not a problem, okay? Um, Hong Kong has excellent business infrastructure. Um, obviously, it's very well known for for yeah for doing business here. So for sure, um, you'd have no issues on that side. Uh, we have a simple tax system and low tax rate here too. Okay, um, you can also note that they have a territorial tax system, so it's possible to apply for tax exemption here. And um, English law is uh, adopted here. English common law is adopted. So it's relatively stable here, obviously, in terms of regulations and quite straightforward. Um, and I mean, in Hong Kong, although, you know, it's, it is part of China, technically, um, there is a multilingual workforce here. So most, uh, most staff here can speak in Chinese as well as English. Um, so that is another plus side, right? Um, last but not least, also Hong Kong is less regulated than a lot of the other countries in Asia. Um, so hence it's easier to set up and also maintain. It also means less requirements. But that was just a quick overview of reasons why you might consider to set up in Hong Kong. Maybe you already decided to, that's why you're watching this. So I'm going to go now into more detail as to what it entails, like setting up in Hong Kong. Is it possible for you to do it while you were overseas? Because obviously COVID situation, you're not, we won't be able to, you may not be able to come travel to Hong Kong and you may not want to considering quarantine uh, requirements at the moment. Uh, so yeah, I'll go further into that to give you some more info. By the way, if you have any questions or anything, as I start talking here, please feel free Free to drop a message or yeah, your, your questions in the chat section and someone will be there to help assist you there okay awesome so let's keep going so first incorporation in hong kong as i mentioned is relatively simple it can take any time from seven days to literally a day depending on your circumstances um being based in philippines though 
um, or if you're anywhere else overseas, generally seven working days from the day you submit all the documents to the company's registry is pretty typical. So you probably may need to send some original documents over to Hong Kong, uh, but then at least it means that you don't need to come to Hong Kong. You can completely set up the company remotely. Uh, only issue may be things with banking and things, but I will cover that in a bit later, okay? So in terms of incorporation, I'm just going to cover the basic um, the basic uh, requirements for Hong Kong so you can know whether or not it's something that you can meet. Generally, it's, it's quite simple here, but the first step basically you want to consider is your company name, obviously. I know that seems obvious, um, but a couple of things to consider are you want to make sure that it does meet requirements for Hong Kong, okay? And um, you can have an English name, you can have a Chinese name, uh, you can have an English or a Chinese name, or you, or you can have both basically, right? Um, but you can't have a single name that contains both English and Chinese characters in it. Um, English meaning Latin characters, so if you wanted to use your own language as long as it's Latin characters, no problem. Um, it's not okay though if it already appears in the company's registry here in Hong Kong. So maybe you want to be setting up an entity in Hong Kong with the same name as your entity overseas in the Philippines, right? Um, so in that case, you want to double check at company's registry. If you're going to be using a provider like us to help you to set it up, so they usually will double check that for you before you go ahead because otherwise, um, yeah, you're on the risk of losing your incorporation fees and things. Um, you want to make sure also that it doesn't constitute a criminal offense. Obviously, not many people would be intending to choose a name in such manner, but just something to consider. And um, you want to avoid words like department, government, commission, or authority. Why? Because that will be flagged by the company's registry here. And they will consider that, like, it sounds like it's linked to the government in some way, basically, right? So you want to avoid that if possible. If you really want to use it, there is a possibility to, um, but it's just a bit more complicated. You have to get approval um, from the company's registry, and it just takes a lot more time. So ideally, you would avoid that completely, okay? Um, and note that a company name in Hong Kong does have to end with the full word limited. So that's the official name. But, you know, your working name, like the name that you present with your brand and things could be something else. Like we're Incubi Limited, right? But we don't put Incubi Limited across everything. We can just use Incubi, for example. Okay, no problem with that. Yeah. Um, then in Hong Kong, you also have to report your business nature when you're incorporating, obviously. Um, it's basically the common description of your business in Hong Kong. As I mentioned at the beginning, Hong Kong companies aren't limited to the official business nature that they report uh, at the company's registry and inland revenue uh, department, actually inland revenue department, not company's registry. Um, so um, as I said, if you maybe you're, you're running a trading company, you wanna be a bit more specific than that actually. If you're trading electronics or trading clothing, you wanna give a little bit more context than just trading, for example, or consulting, you wanna give a bit more context for what that entails. Uh, otherwise, inland revenue may uh, flag, then flag that description and they may ask you for more uh, information on it. Um, but yeah, but then if even if you're running a trading company, in, in certain products. You can still do consulting on the side, you can still do other things um, as long as the business isn't regulated. So more on that. Um, let me go through there. Yeah, so, okay, the business nature will appear on your business registration certificate. So bear that in mind because you'll be presenting those kind of documents to certain people. If you don't want, if you want to show a certain business nature, you may want to consider how to report that more carefully. Um, and then uh, it's has to be 60 characters max in English, okay? That's including spaces. Just a tip, um, they divide it into two lines. So it's 30 characters and then 30 characters on two lines, okay? Um, if uh, you have a regulated business, regulated I mean like a business that requires special licenses. So if you're going to be running an education like center, for example, that usually requires some kind of special license uh, or travel agency is a good example. Um, so um, with, with that kind of thing, you want to be careful with the type of business nature that you report. You may want to check with the related department uh, if they have special requirements for what you're going to report as the business nature, okay? 
anyway, if you're using a provider, they should be able to help you with that, right? Um, Hong Kong companies are also required, it's a must for them to have a registered address in Hong Kong, okay? So that may be a reason why you might want to use a provider, uh, because a provider will usually offer uh, an address that you can use, okay? A local address. Uh, the address cannot be a care of address. You might have a friend here you want to do care of, or a PO box is also not allowed. Um, and um, registered address is usually used for administrative purposes, okay? So meaning uh, for receiving like government mails and things, because usually the registered address is at the same address as your company secretary who will manage the legal maintenance of your company. I'll talk more about that role in a bit. Um, but in that case, if you wanted to have like an admin address, you could use your register address for that. And then you can have a separate address for your business operations, okay? And the business operations address would be reported to the Inland Revenue Department in a different section, okay? Uh, that's not a problem. You just have to inform your company secretary to help you to report accordingly, okay? Um, obviously, if you're going to be setting up a company, you'll have to consider the shares and share capital. Uh, so yes, for the for this case, I'm going to be talking about sh uh, companies limited by shares, right? Because um, there are too many different types of entities, so I'm just going to be focusing on that for today. Um, but and it's the most common as well, actually. Um, but yeah, so you have different types of shares in Hong Kong. You could, or actually anywhere, right? Um, but you can report. Um, like ordinary shares is the bulk standard type of shares. Uh, that's perfectly fine if you're only going to have like um, one shareholder, right? right? Or two shareholders, but with the same kind of rights. If you're going to be, um, if you're going to have more than one shareholder that has, uh, and they have different rights to the company, so then you could consider issuing like preference shares. Um, in that case, on incorporation, you need to report what their rights are uh, under those different types of shares, okay? A Hong Kong company has to have a minimum of one uh, share at uh, one, Hong, one Hong Kong dollar, okay, um, or other convertible currency, right? Why would you want to use another convertible currency? Maybe you're, yeah, if you're doing operations in Philippines, your customers are paying in pesos, for example. So in that case, um, you may want to report in your accounting in pesos. So make accounting easier later because you don't have to do the whole conversion thing there, okay? Um, you can issue shares to anybody. Um, it can be resident, foreigner, individual, corporate. And um, one thing you need to consider when you're um, when you're considering the amount of share capital you're starting up with or you're reporting uh, on incorporation uh, is if your business is regulated. So again, as I mentioned, that means a business that has a specific license. Um, in the case of travel agencies, for example, so you are, I think you're required to report 500,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars worth uh, share capital at the beginning, um, obviously to cover things like if there's any issue with a travel agency, for example. Um, so you want to double check depending on the license that you may need. But generally, the business license that you're issued at the beginning covers most businesses, just so you know. Okay, And you can report any amount of, sh of uh, share capital as long as it's not less than one. Okay. Um, so directors and shareholders, um, as you may know, like in some countries in the air in, in Asia, um, they do have specific requirements that you have to have like a local director, shareholder, that is not a requirement in Hong Kong. Okay, so what are the requirements here? So directors um, are required, so first, what are their responsibilities? Let's cover that first. Um, they must exercise reasonable um, care um, in operating the business, okay? So, because they are legally responsible for making sure that the company is run properly in a legal way. Uh, so they should understand, whoever's being appointed as director should understand that when they are taking on that role at the beginning. And usually the director obviously is representing shareholders, um, defending the interests of the board, right? Um, Hong Kong companies must have a minimum of one individual directors, individual meaning an actual person. Uh, so if you are planning to have a corporate director, uh, then you must have at least one other individual director as well in place. Directors can be of any nationality, any residency, you don't need to show a local address for your um, directors. And uh, directors do not need to be shareholders, okay, just so you know, that's not a must in Hong Kong. 
shareholders, on the other hand, um, obviously the owners of the company, you can have um, you must have a minimum of one corporate or individual shareholder. So in this case, there's no requirement to have an individual shareholder. So as I mentioned earlier, you can have a wholly owned subsidiary in Hong Kong, which is great if you already have an existing entity uh, in the Philippines or wherever you're located or you're watching this from. Um, and, um, and yeah, or if you want to be the sole director shareholder, no problem. You can also do that as well. Again, any nationality, residency, and you can have a maximum of 50 shareholders if you so wish, although um, I don't know why you need so many. <laughs> and then aside from that, uh, you want to consider uh, who's going to take the role uh, of company secretary in your company. Okay, uh, Hong Kong companies are required to, it is compulsory for them uh, to have a company secretary uh, because they're responsible for maintaining the records um, and ensuring compliance and requirements, okay? So it's not just someone who's going to be managing admin, but they really, I mean, it is, they do handle admin related matters, uh, but it is relating to the legal uh, maintenance of the company, okay? Um, who can be the comp sec and that's it in that case okay so you can have a natural person who is a hong kong resident an individual um and uh, in that case no certification is required um or you can have a corporate body uh, a provider essentially um who um has a registered address in hong kong okay and they must have a valid tcsp license as a trust and corporate service provider license okay so you want to make sure if you do use a provider in hong kong uh which is recommended because um they can help guide you through the whole thing right um they should have the proper license in place you can actually check that just a tip on the tcsp registry uh, it's online in hong kong just search tcsp license and you'll find it um note though if you're if you have a friend for example and you're thinking to put them as the comp sec it's not a problem they could if they are resident in hong kong only thing is that of course um managing the company like the legal maintenance is not difficult but it does in, entail some expertise right to knowing what the regulations are in hong kong keeping up to date with them um so it's recommended to appoint someone who at least knows what are the requirements in hong kong what are the deadlines for all the filings etc okay um and um a director of the company can also be the company secretary okay um if they are not a sole director so if you're going to be the sole director shareholder so you can't also be the comp set company secretary um in that case then you may need a provider or obviously someone else to help you on that side of things okay um so yeah that was very briefly the incorporation side of things um uh, after you're incorporated that's actually kind of the easiest part, setting up the company in Hong Kong. It's not too difficult. The more complicated part will be maintaining it after, okay? Um, there are various legal requirements uh, that you need to, to do, like you have to report, like who do you have to report to? So on a yearly basis, um, you if you have any changes to the directors, their particulars, uh, like their address, their passport, for example, is updated. So, uh, or maybe you want to add a director, remove a director, all these changes need to report be reported to the company's registry or the inland revenue department, depending on the type of change or whatever it is you're making, uh, adjustment you're making. Um, and in some cases, a resolution may need to be drawn up and you may need to also update your statutory records, right? Like the register, your registers, etc. cetera. Um, and um, there's a deadline, it's 14 days from the date of the change that you're supposed to report those types of things. Um, you're also required on a yearly basis to renew your business registration certificate. Uh, usually you'll receive a debit note a month to two weeks before your incorporation anniversary date every year. Um, and you have to settle an amount on there. At the moment, the amount for renewal is only 250 Hong Kong dollars uh, because there's a waiver from the government. That's just at the moment, normally it's 2,250, okay? Just so you know. So uh, in case you are quite ready to set up already, you may want to take advantage of setting up now because the business registration amount will only be 250. <laughs> uh, although they may, they may waive it again in the coming year, let's see. Uh, you also have to do on a yearly basis um, an annual return filing. Okay, so this isn't tax related. 
It's uh, a report of your company as at its incorporation anniversary date every year. You can think of it as like a picture of your company, like who are the latest shareholders, who are the latest directors, okay? So during the year, you will have reported what the changes were, and then on that date, all the updated information will be shown every single year. So if someone wants to download that information to see what's the latest information of the company, they can. Banks may do that, for example. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I know that sounds like a lot of things. All those things aren't necessarily, again, not necessarily difficult, but there's a lot of small, small things and there's deadlines to meet. Uh, the annual return, for example, has to be filed within 42 days of your incorporation date. Um, and then business registration has also uh, an expiry date and a renewal a special um, sorry, deadline for making the payment as well. So you'll want to find somebody who can help manage that for you, unless you have the time, obviously, to go through that. But it's your company secretary who should be handling that for you, basically. Basically. So hence, you want to find someone who has the right expertise. Uh, or if you have time, then go through that. But if you're a business owner, I am pretty sure you probably won't have time to go through that. <laughs> and just for a minimal fee, you can hire someone to assist you with that, right? Um, but again, up to you. Not for you to use us or anybody. You can use anyone. No worries. <laughs> um, but yeah, just a tip, actually. If you're trying to find a company secretary provider in Hong Kong, best way to find out which one suits you best um, I would send out one email to various providers you're considering, okay, exact same email, the same content, and see who replies you the fastest, who replies you um, most professionally, most complete, right? Make sure they actually answer all your questions. Uh, and then based on that, you can see which one you want to work with, right? Who's more professional, who takes care of you the best, and of course, uh, matches your price range, although price isn't number one, always remember that. Because most expensive doesn't mean they're the best and cheapest also could mean uh, you run the risk of having your company not maintained properly. We've had a lot of people come over, move over the companies to us with the same situation. So just something to bear in mind, okay? Uh, just a tip. And being overseas as well, just one more thing. You'll want to have somebody good to maintain that for you. Because obviously if you're not here then and you're not familiar with the local regulations, again, uh, you want somebody who knows their stuff, right? Um, so yeah, uh, that was all the incorporation, basic maintenance. After that, obviously, there's some other key things like banking, uh, accounting, audit tax filing, HR matters. I'll run through those quickly with you now. Um, so in terms of banking, this is the big hot question I know everybody always asks, and this is probably the hardest requirement for people who are located overseas. So yeah, okay, incorporation you can handle remotely. Banking though, a little bit more complicated. So um, Hong Kong banks, well, let me start from the beginning. First, Hong Kong companies are not required to have an account in Hong Kong, although obviously if you're setting up a, bank, um, a company in Hong Kong, you're most likely going to be wanting to set up a bank account here too, obviously. I understand that, but it's not mandatory if for whatever reason you're able to consider having an account elsewhere. Um, and you can have as many or as few as you want, uh, as accounts as you want, anywhere you want, okay? Like, for example, we offer different, um, yeah, uh, different solutions in other countries for people who may be struggling to set up an account in Hong Kong. Um, why have they been struggling to set up an account in Hong Kong? Because banks in Hong Kong do require a visit in person. Um, well, for the most part, some have been a bit more lenient uh, since this whole COVID situation. Uh, they do offer some options for remote account opening. Uh, for example, I know HSBC does in some cases, uh, if you have the right contact, um, they will accept you to go to the HSBC overseas if the branch there will accept to uh, verify your identity, etc., for them here in Hong Kong. So they could process it through that branch. But you need to seek out a branch that will, will accept to do that uh, overseas. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so that's an option. Some other ones also um, allow, like I think DBS was offering for a while, but they keep updating, changing the requirements. You want to double check with the bank that you prefer, what their latest requirements are. That's super important. Um, um, but if you do manage to arrange it in that way, then you want to be thinking about what are the bank's requirements, okay? Very important check beforehand, before you have the meeting so that you can make the most uh, of it and also to make sure the processing is as fast as possible, okay? So um, basically the point is you just want to be meeting the bank's expectations and fears. If you're overseas, they just um, want to know your legitimate business, 
uh, not overseas, anywhere actually. Um, they want to know your legitimate business, that you as a director or shareholder have the experience related to the business you're running. Um, just let me run through a few of the requirements for you, okay? So um, first you want to check who needs to attend the meeting, if you're going to be having a meeting with them. Um, and because sometimes they need directors, shareholders, check if they need a meeting in person in Hong Kong, obviously. Um, what documents are required? So they will need the, typically obviously the corporate documents at the beginning so your company secretary can provide that for you that includes your certificate and corporation articles of association um business registration and your corporation form um you'll need to provide the id uh, address proof of the directors and shareholders of the company um cv as well to prove uh, that you have the experience i mentioned in the business um they will ask for certified copies of a lot of those documents, okay? Um, so if you manage to find a way to get to Hong Kong and to visit the bank yourself, um, they can do the certified copies at the bank. They give you actually a list at the beginning and tell you you need to do by a lawyer, or notaries, and something like that. Uh, but actually, um, if you go to the bank directly with the originals in hand, they can do it for you there and it saves you a little bit of money as well, okay? Um, and also the resolutions, they will ask you for resolutions in their list. Um, in that case, um, yeah, they will do that also at the bank. So don't, don't fret too much about that, okay? Um, if your documents are in another language, uh, I know that's probably not a problem in the Philippines because they have a lot in uh, English as well, but just in case, uh, you may be asked for a certified translation, actually you will be. Um, and uh, consider also what is the minimum deposit at the bank. Um, account that you're planning to set up. Okay, I know I think HSBC, their latest or for some of their corporate accounts, it's 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. So um, it's not too big, but it's also not too little. So you want to be prepared, right? So now with that said, those are the traditional banks. And I know that may not be the best option at the moment if you're based overseas. No worries, not to fret. There are also other options that you can consider. Fintechs, I'm sure you've probably heard about them. Uh, there are several fintech options to choose from. You know, some specialize in payments, others in financing, like trade finance, uh, others in like for, uh, Forex. Um, and in that case, actually, they're quite convenient because a lot of them can offer, actually most of them, that's why they're fintechs, offer online registration. Uh, you can, for the most part, sign up remotely and um, you can choose to sign up for more than one with very minimal risk. They don't normally typically need a minimum balance either, okay? But then obviously they all have different, um, uh, different um, offerings. They may not be as comprehensive, complete as a bank, who can offer, you know, like credit, la la la, etc. those things. So you will want to double check what they can offer. But if you only need like an account for um, transferring money to somebody or receiving payments, then for sure, there are definitely some very good options out there. And there are a few as well who offer cards actually at the moment. So and they're getting better as the, as the, as the sector is growing. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just something to consider. If um, we offer a few, actually we have a few fintech partners, but generally you can just search online to be honest, fintech and you'll see there'll be a whole bunch that come up there, okay? So that's definitely uh, something to consider during this time when you're not able to, tra to travel to Hong Kong or anywhere for that matter actually. Um, so aside from bank account opening, um, obviously on a yearly basis you'll need to handle, not yearly, you may want to do quarterly, different periods, your accounting, audit, and tax filing. Um, so uh, accounting in Hong Kong uh, is basically like anywhere else, obviously, but there are requirements here to meet in Hong Kong. Um, it is essential to maintain proper accounts. Um, during the year, you will want to, this won't be affected by COVID, obviously, because you can just manage this wherever you are. The main point is that uh, you want to keep your operating records organized okay so if you're doing everything online it's quite good because obviously most online apps and things will have a record of things but if not you'll want to save copies of everything that you have okay um but yeah you'll need to keep you know your book of accounts your vouchers bank statements invoices receipts um and you want to keep them in an orderly fashion to reduce the cost of your accounting because if it's more organized then it's easier for your accountant to help you prepare the accounting if you're not doing it yourself uh, anyone in anyone can do 
and uh, accounting for a Hong Kong company. Just anyone with knowledge, you don't need to have a special certification or anything like that. And um, you should, uh, Hong Kong companies are required to hold their records for at least seven years, okay? Uh, in paper or digital form, that is fine, okay? Uh, and also like uh, accountants like us, for example, we can accept all records in digital form, no problem. We provide cloud actually for our customers to upload all their documents, so it's easy for us to review. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of providers nowadays can probably accommodate that as well. And if you're using a software like Xero, then even easier, you just give access to the records you've been maintaining in there, okay? Uh, but yeah, but always just bear in mind, as I said, anyone with knowledge can do it, but there are certain standards to be met, so you probably wanna hire a Hong Kong-based uh, accountant to do it for you, okay? Uh, audit um, is also a yearly requirement in Hong Kong for all companies, even if you haven't done any business. I know that sounds very weird, uh, but I'll explain a bit more in a second. But anyway, first things first, um, once a year, you're supposed to do your audit. And it should be, actually the first year, sorry, should be done within the first 18 months uh, of incorporation, uh, because that's also the time your first profits tax return will come in. And then after that, so you choose at that time your year end for your accounting and things. And then after that, on a yearly basis, uh, you will need to do your audit. Okay. Um, only qualified CPA, Hong Kong CPA, can do your audit. Uh, but this, again, it can be handled remotely. You don't need to be in Hong Kong to be handling this. So it's just a matter of finding a provider who can help you. Um, most providers who offer company secretary and incorporation like us, uh, we, they offer accounting or the tax filing as well. Okay, so we do that as well, others do as well. So uh, it should be relatively simple for you to arrange that. Um, and the cost depends on who your auditor is, the volume of transactions, um, how accounts and records are organized. Um, again, it's important to keep those uh, tidy because the more your auditor has to look through, then maybe the costs may go higher, okay? Um, now, audited accounts in Hong Kong uh, are filed to the, to the Inland Revenue Department, um, and they're not public, okay? So nobody will know what's on your books, basically, uh, in Hong Kong. So, um, yeah, if, 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 if that's something that you are looking for. Um, one thing to consider, don't underestimate the amount of work it implies. Uh, your auditor will ask you for a lot of information. They need it just to do the audit, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it's good to start earlier uh, to do your audit, okay? And uh, then um, Hong Kong companies also have to arrange the profits tax filing uh, yearly basis again. Um, so your first profits tax return will arrive within 18 months of the incorporation date of your company. Okay. Then after that has to be filed annually. Okay. As long as the form has been uh, issued, you need to file it basically, even if you've not done any operations, anything, you still have to file it. Okay. Um, I put there, yeah, it must be filed annually unless business is not commenced or is making a loss. Um, so yeah, so what I mean by that is, so maybe in the first year you didn't make any business or you report a loss. So Inland Revenue Department will not issue another profits tax return for like usually two, three years, something like that, because they just assume your company is still in that state, okay? In the meantime, though, you are still required, uh, you are required, sorry, to inform them if you do start operating or if you do start uh, having business uh, or making a uh, profit, rather. Um, yeah, that's up to you to do that, okay? Uh, but when I say up to you, if you have an, a CPA, a Certified Public Accountant, helping you with that, you just inform them and they will know anyway if you're using them for their, for their services. Uh, and then they will help you do the necessary filings to Inland Revenue Department, okay? Again, all this can be handled uh, remotely. Actually, sorry, correction. Profits tax return, the form itself. The, some auditors do accept to do the filing online, although it's quite rare because generally speaking, um, yeah, because they need to verify certain things. They would usually uh, do it in paper form, the filing. Um, so they may ask you to sign the original profits tax return form. So this is a little bit tricky uh, when you are based overseas, uh, but it's not impossible. It's just a matter of getting courier back and forth, right? But again, um, 
don't underestimate the time it takes to handle these things, so better to answer. Uh, so once you find out you have the property tax return, better to handle it promptly to avoid any issues. Obviously, with COVID, the whole like you know courier sometimes is delayed and things, so something to take into consideration. Okay. Um, in Hong Kong, we have a two-tier tax system. Um, so the first two million profits a company makes is taxed at only 8.25%, so super low. Okay. Um, and then uh, anything above that is 16.5%. Okay, so both both rates are super low. Uh, one reason a lot of people like to incorporate in Hong Kong. Um, we have a ter territorial tax system here. So what does that mean? That means um, you, if you're operating overseas, all your operations overseas, you don't have an office in located, a physical office located in Hong Kong, uh, your directors are not here, for example, um, and all your uh, buyers or whatever are, are based overseas as well. So then you have the opportunity to apply for tax exemption, um, meaning that you don't have to pay tax. Uh, yeah, you don't have to pay tax, okay? Um, because you're only taxed on um, profits derived in Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, but that's it. Okay, so tax exemption is not automatic in Hong Kong. A lot of people think it is. Uh, you actually have to apply for it. How do you do that? Um, at the time of your audit, you need to tell your auditor that you're intending to apply for offshore status and you don't want to be paying tax because all your operations are overseas. Okay, then they will put a line in their audit stating that an inland revenue department will treat that as an application for tax exemption. Okay, um, it takes time to get the application approved. It's not just a matter of filing, and it's not per it's not a permanent status. You apply per financial year. Okay, so what happens is basically after you've submitted that application, uh, inland revenue department will follow up with queries to make sure to check really if your if your claim is valid. They'll ask you a whole bunch of questions about your operations and things, uh, and it's an ongoing process. So, um, so let's say okay, one year you reported profits. They ask you some questions. Okay. Normally, maybe three years, similar like in the case of when you're making a loss, they don't ask for three years for profits tax return. They will kind of leave it for three years, let's say. Um, but then after that period, they may come back again with more questions to, to continue checking that your status is offshore is still valid, basically. Um, it's an expensive process. Um, just to give you an idea, our minimum is something like 45000 Only Maybe in some cases we can consider it cheaper, but it is a pretty expensive process because you're getting the assistance of a tax advisor. Um, so uh, generally speaking, I think we'd say that unless you're um, really, you know for sure you can make a lot of profits, uh, you may just want to consider paying the tax considering it is super cheap here in Hong Kong anyway. Okay. Um, last but not least, I'm going to cover about human resources. Okay, uh, so this is probably quite important because if you are based overseas, you may want to have somebody running your business here in Hong Kong for you, or maybe you're planning to come to Hong Kong. I'll cover both scenarios, okay? Um, Hong Kong companies are required to um, file an employer's return to the Inland Revenue Department in various situations. So uh, if you're going to be hiring an employee, you need to report the commencement within three months um, from their start. Um, and then if you're terminating an employee, so then one month before their termination. Now, they're not super strict on that one, obviously, because you can't always tell when uh, someone's going to be terminated. But, um, but yeah, as long as you do it promptly, that's the most important. But those are the official guidelines um, or rules, rather, not guidelines. So you should try to meet that if possible. Um, and then um, if you have employees, right, uh, every year after you've already reported the commencement or even after the first year, because IRD will issue an employer's tax return, employer's return rather, to you in the first year to check whether or not you have employees, um, you need to declare in your employer's return the total earnings of each employee in the last assessment year. So in Hong Kong, uh, the assessment year, actually even for your audit and for um, uh, and for the employer's return is between 1st of April to 31st of March. So that's Inland Revenue Department's financial year, okay? Um, Hong Kong companies also are required to, it is compulsory for them to take out employees' compensation insurance uh, for work injury and MPF. Um, 
So MPF is a uh, is basically like a pension scheme in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a pension scheme in Hong Kong. You have to contribute up to five percent of the person's salary, or one thousand five hundred Hong Kong dollars a month, depending on their um, uh, depending on whichever one is higher. Okay. Um, and these though can be avoided if your staff are uh, located not within Hong Kong. Okay. If you have freelance workers and things, there are some. Uh, situations where they don't need you don't need to take these out these types of insurances um, medical insurance is optional though okay uh, although if you want to be a good employer you will want to get them some <laughs> um, then employment visa this may be the more um, hold on, just add some other things there I'm jumping a bit quickly there um, so yeah so for Hong Kong as well, you will want to get a proper employment visa if you're hiring a foreigner worker who's going to be physically working in Hong Kong. Um, they need to have a visa, okay, a working visa. Um, if they're already in Hong Kong, so it's a matter of changing their status to be working under your company. Uh, but until that status is reported, that change is reported rather, uh, you can they cannot be working for your company in the meantime, okay? Uh, you have to get approval from immigration first, and then they can work for your company, just so you know, okay? Uh, now, if you're based um, overseas and you're planning to make the move into Hong Kong, that's why you want to set up your Hong Kong company. Uh, so in that case, you can actually sponsor your own visa. It doesn't have to be employment visa, though, okay? Uh, Actually, we used to say employment visa was the way to go because um, uh, immigration would accept that here before. Uh, you could have your company basically have the company sponsor your employment visa uh, for you to work in Hong Kong because obviously being the founder, no one else can take that role, right? But immigration um, now have, um, they find it more appropriate, let's say, uh, if you go for an entrepreneur visa. Okay, so you're coming in obviously as an entrepreneur in Hong Kong, it makes more sense. And your company that you set up can sponsor that visa for you to come. You don't need to have um, yeah, any other sponsors for that. Okay, um, so that is an option. Uh, employers, uh, when you are making a visa application in Hong Kong, uh, in whichever case, the employer will need to provide a business plan or even if you're doing the entrepreneur entrepreneur visa, your company will still need to provide a business plan. Um, if you haven't actually started operations, no problem. The business plan can be like tentative, you know, uh, sharing what the potential business may be like, what the you know future business will be like. Okay. When you're preparing that, you want to consider uh, that the immigration will be looking for things like, okay, is the company renting an office in Hong Kong? Are they employing local staff? Okay. Um, basically, they're looking to see whether you are um, trying to contribute to the local economy, essentially, okay? Uh, and But bear in mind that it's not just about trying to fulfill visa application requirements. Later, when the visa has to be renewed again, they will double check whether or not you have actually fulfilled what you said in your business plan. If not, uh, then you may need to explain why you haven't, okay? so. It's good to make to keep that in mind as you're preparing that to make sure it's something that you're actually going to do, right? Um, and yeah, just one thing to think about with visas, though, if you are hiring others for the company, like you're doing employment visa, immigration is quite strict in terms of they will usually only grant visas for like professionals, so somebody who really um, who has a very specific qualification in that area. If they think that the, the position can be fulfilled by somebody in Hong Kong, it's less likely that they're going to be granting uh, the visa. Okay, uh, so for example, customer service, it's not likely that they would approve that because for sure they would think that you could fulfill that role here in Hong Kong and they don't take language into consideration. Okay, so you can't say, okay, no, I need this uh, person because they're Danish speaking, let's say, whatever. Uh, so in that case, that's not a reason. Uh, they will look purely at the job position itself. Okay, just something to bear in mind. Um, so yeah, that's it for human resources. Uh, so last but not least, I've been talking a lot. I know I've just given you a whole bunch of information. Okay. Um, yeah, just don't worry, basically. <laughs> um, I know, like, I give you a lot of information. Um, 
but everybody has to go through that if they're coming into Hong Kong or elsewhere. Every company also has a lot of requirements. Hong Kong is, in comparison to the country, other countries, much, uh, much simpler uh, to set up and maintain the company here, and it's definitely happening you're definitely able to handle it remotely, okay? Um, just be careful not to underestimate the quantity of work that it requires to meet uh, minimum requirements. Really think it through before you do go ahead with the incorporation because there are regular annual requirements to meet. Um, and so, and it costs money, right? So it's not a matter of just setting up and that's it. Yeah, bear in mind there are continuing requirements. Um, so yeah, with that said, you know, keep your records in order and consider, do you want to handle it yourself or get someone else to do it for you? Okay, that's not a plug for you to use us. Again, as I said, you can try, do that email thing I mentioned uh, to find a provider that suits you the best. But being remote, if you are overseas, if you're in Philippines, uh, yeah, for sure, obviously, you will you may need the help of somebody who knows the local regulations. And aside from that anyway, is it worth your time to be handling those things yourself, trying to work it out yourself? Um, do you have the time? Uh, and what should you prioritize as an entrepreneur, as a business uh, holder, right? So yeah, be realistic and uh, seek some serious external help, okay? Uh, so yeah, I hope that was uh, helpful to you. If you're considering setting up in Hong Kong, maybe I didn't cover something here today and you have some doubts, you know, considering the situation at the moment, um, you're most welcome to drop uh, some email and details on the slide there. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, mention drop them in the chat and someone will come back to you on that. Thank you so much for watching today.